Oh, so I thought this was really interesting. I, I, I have a feeling you're conflating risk with adverse circumstances in the sense that suppose that you knew for sure there's going to be five more weeks with high temperature. Wouldn't the same thing happen? So is it really risk and coping with risk or is it adverse circumstances? And the adverse circumstances, the, the evidence you show about uh, remittances and you know, the correlation with the, the fraction of people who, um, who had uh, immigrated before, that doesn't tell you that it's risk sharing. It's, it could, again, be income support. And I do think it's really important to not say risk if, you know, if really you mean income. And then the other thing that you didn't touch upon was uh, what about switching to crops that are more heat resistant and do you see any evidence on that? And if that is possible, maybe that would be a good source of uh, policy, uh, you know, policy reforms. Shall we just do all the questions first? Yes. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, great. Um, I actually have two, too. Um, first of all, super interesting. I've seen this paper presented before, but I love how you guys are able to really pin down exactly the mechanism, what's, what's going on. Very, very interesting. Um, first question is on uh, property rights in El Salvador. Uh, I wonder if part of the effect could be uh, driven, especially on the discrepancy between the landless and the landowners. I'm thinking of the paper like the Americ de jean and Sadolet paper in Mexico that shows that once you give um, uh, farmers uh, titles to their land, that's when they're more likely to migrate. So actually the ones who own land, they don't want to migrate because it would, it would take, uh, like the, the, the property rights aren't secure enough for them to do so. Then, so then you see actually the, the landless one migrating more because they don't have that, uh, that challenge. So that would be good to, um, to clarify. And then of course myself, I'm always curious about the interaction. I'm sure you've run these things just on on the on rainfall i had i had expected rainfall to be a big one but and also the interaction of these two right i've kind of heard that like um often it's not just the fact that you would have very hot days but that the hot days that remain dry as well is is where the issue was i i believe but again you fully run these things <laughs> thank you very interesting um, thanks a lot so suppose there's significant heterogeneity in our willingness to migrate. So each of us, for each of us, there is a threshold, an individual threshold, uh, on the size of the shock that would lead us to migrate, right? And, 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 and then what, what could be the case is that people in those regions um, in, in, in which my, the, the, there are tons of migrants, I mean, where many people left, uh, well, maybe, maybe the issue is that all those with low thresholds um, are not there, any, not there anymore. So, so the fact that you then observe low migration, low additional migration in those regions, might not be due to the fact that they're very better insured, but that the population itself is less willing to migrate. I mean, the, the migrant pool has been depleted. And so, my question is, how how do you, how I mean, could there be a way to uh, address that concern? Thank you. Very interesting paper, so uh, there are lots of points, but very quickly, uh, why two standard deviations? So you, you, you give the choice, but you don't explain it. Uh, do, do you look only at the adjustment on labor? Uh, if the shock is persistent, maybe capital can also change if you have the information. And my third point is uh, similar to the colleague that talked about income. Uh, I think, yeah, it's probably income heterogeneity rather than, and what maybe you can look at, um, even if we uh, exclude remittances, uh, if you have a small farm and a big farm, it's not the same. So I don't know if you look at farmers by quantile or by whatever. Uh, and my last point is, um, you said you don't look at the shock for a different, for a long period, but I think uh, if the shock is persistent, maybe two, three, four years, maybe this could push them more to migrate rather than if they know if it's just one year. And thank you. Thank you so much. I think you are like touching all the all the points we are working on. So let me just go back to first, and Ana Maria, please help me uh, with like with anything that I I forget or that I um, 
don't answer complete. Uh, the persistence of the effects, this is so important, right? Particularly because if you think this international migration, uh, this is very costly. Is one shock going to be enough to push you to migrate internationally again with everything that is happening in, in the US? So yes, I think that is very important to address and we don't have it right now, but now we are, we just run those regressions where we are doing exactly what you're saying of we have um, the temperature shock in T minus one and we are controlling all, also for the accumulated shock T minus two to T minus five. When we have, when we, when we run that regression, we do find that those accumulated effects, that also matters. Um, but it doesn't really change the magnitude of T minus one. So it also matters, right? Like definitely what happened two or three years ago also matters. But when we compare those magnitudes, it's really what is driving the effect is what you just perceived the year before. Um, so that is, that is one. And I think again, it's because of the context. These are very small farmers that are like, they rely on, 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 on that crop so much. Capital effects, yes, that is great. And uh, the agricultural survey actually is really good. Uh, we have explored the different things, but yes, we should look at again what we have like the stock of capital. What we see is just like what is happening with the inputs that they can um, manage with, but for more like medium term effects, we can see what is happening with the, with the capital. So I can, we can do that. Um, yeah, Tomas, I think that is a very good point and I would, I want to give more time to the other presentations, but I would love to talk more about it with you. I need to be honest, I'm the one that is like married to those results because I think, it, yeah, you just have like, it has a very nice story, but we cannot, honestly, I just don't think we can identify it well because of all the problems that you are raising and uh, Raquel and you raise as well. Is this really re access to rescoping mechanisms or are these just like regions that are very different? These are regions that are just richer uh, in other ways, right? You have more migrants and uh, because of that, you have better income and that's why you are staying is really now no access to that. Um, so, but I would love to talk more about it if you can think about like any uh, way of, of really exploiting these effects. I accept this is right now, I think one of the, the, the weak parts from a, a like empirical point of view. It's not well identified. There are many things happening at the same time. Um, eh, yes, rainfall. Uh, yeah, again, I would love to talk more with you about it. We do control for rainfall. And I, I, I went super fast through that, but we control for rainfall. And actually we have been debating on, is this a whole like weather shocks paper or is this temperature shock? What we see and what we have seen like later in the, in the, in the literature is that temperature is uh, more of a shock. At least with rainfall, they could uh, store it and uh, it's not, it doesn't have such a such a perfect prediction on on uh, corn production, whereas temperature has. So we are following that uh, that literature, and we do control for rainfall all, every time, but we don't see a clear pattern with rainfall shocks, whereas with temperature we do. Um, and and I think the property rights is <laughs> very important. And now we are actually playing more with it. And now we have like completely people that have no access to land at all, people that are renting land, people that really are the landowners. And we have important heterogeneity there. And we are we were just working yesterday and trying to understand those results, but I think it's very important, particularly if we think about policy implications. Um, yes. And um other agricultural sectors, yes, uh, we were thinking about it and we see no movement at all. Uh, we see that they are not, we were surprised by it and we were surprised by not seeing that they go to the non-agricultural sector, but we see no evidence about um, like movement to these other sectors. Um, but thank you so much for all your suggestions. We are rewriting these papers. All of this is very, very useful. Thank, thank you all. Uh, about the increase in reporting crime to the police, I, I think, um, so you said um, it's conditional of, there is, um, there are surveys, opinion surveys where people are asked if they like living close to a migrant or not. Yes. Okay. So we, we've used this in one of the papers on integration and maybe you can use it to, to check if, uh, 
if the people who report or not are correspond to these places where there are high levels or low levels of people hating migrants or, or who dislike li living close to migrants. These are super interesting results, and I was wondering if you could also, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think maybe the IFLS has a module on, on victimization and fear, um, and fear of being victimized. So I don't know if you could see if not only they, they are being victimized, they are saying more or less like the victimization, but whether they are, they are reporting more fear. Um, I'm not. I think I think the the Mexican Family Life Survey follows the module of the IFLS, and they have a whole module of fear of victimization, that could be interesting to explore. My question is about the instrument, and how can it be explained by state presence in the sense of uh, uh, a rainfall shock is way more. Um, important in the area when the, the state doesn't do enough investment in the um, like the, the handling of that rainfall. So could that be uh, maybe tampering with the actual effect of rainfall? Yes. Related to the instrument as well, um, I think that the effect of rainfall and migration might not be monotonic because like you have the monsoons in Indonesia that like you have low rainfall, you have more migration, but you ha if you have too much rainfall, you have more migration as well. So um, do you deal with that? Um, trying to um, make maybe dummies um, on, rain on rainfall for instruments? Mine may not be really a concern very much. I'm not sure. I'm not, I was wondering about the exclusion restriction. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know what's grown in Indonesia particularly, but I was worrying about the extent to which rainfall shocks are correlated across different areas. They're migrating out of those areas, and therefore you would have a terms of trade, basically internal uh, ter terms of trade shock within the country. Just very quickly, very quickly, is there a way to reconcile the two um, results that you have, like a quick back of envelope calculation to say what's the share of the effect that you find that's due to um, reporting, more reporting in a sense? Yeah. One question that, that I don't know if, if it's you, you will be able to see it, but we don't know where, where the victimization, the, the crime is increased. Why is increasing? Is it increasing because they arrive to the destination cities and migrants get involved in crime or because migrants are more victimized? Here in Colombia, what we have found, a, a paper by Ana Maria Trivina and Brian, I don't remember his last name. Night. Uh, he finds, uh, they find that the ones who were victimized were the migrants. Yeah. So, so crimes reports were increasing, but it, it was the migrants. The other thing that I wanted also to raise is what you were mentioning about the, the reports, the newspaper reports. There is a very nice paper for Germany uh, where they see what happens when a, when a newspaper changed their policy such that now they reported the nationality of the migrants. Mm -hmm. And instead of increasing xenophobia, it decreased because then people knew. Uh, so I don't know if the, with the newspaper report you are able to see whether they are reporting that the crimes were committed by migrants. This is more difficult because these are internal migrants, but it would be interesting to, to see whether that is the case. have more newspapers reporting that like crimes when they're committed by migrants, like highlighting that it was migrants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much. I love all these comments and I'll be around in case anybody else wants to talk afterwards as well. Um, just because it's fresh in my mind, let me start with this, this last uh, discussion uh, with an unfortunate note that we know nothing about the perpetrator. 
nothing. There's no information about the perpetrator. That is unfortunate. Um, these, keep in mind that we are not scraping these newspaper articles. This is this existing data set uh, that's been collected by, uh, by various folks, various folks in the um, um, Indonesian government, World Bank, various uh, groups. So, so, so we had the data is what the data is. Um, so we don't know much about the, or anything about the perpetrator. Um, the victim, however, Anna Maria, we do um, from that how yeah from well and from the household survey. So, um, so, so yeah, we that's definitely on our list, and that's why I'm presenting that household survey results a little bit, you know, very preliminary. There's just so many more things, you know, migrant of origin, um, uh, um, gender. I can imagine being interesting skill level. Like I can imagine the various uh, heterogeneity being really interesting. So we'll definitely do that. Now let me go back in order. Um, Yes, I'm very familiar with uh, the data you're describing. Um, I, uh, I have a very old paper using the World Value Survey, which I think is the main survey you had in mind. And I'm actually going to show a slide from, um, from that very old paper. Um, if you could click, please, on this little attitude button here. It's going to pop up. Uh, um, this is, uh, there's actually two, there's three or four main questions from this World Value Survey. I only got this one on the slides. One is, do you want to live next to a migrant? This is the one, if jobs are scarce, employers should give priority to natives over migrants. And it asks, do you disagree, neither, or agree? Um, this was done for a human development report, so we don't have by GDP, but we have done by, by the Human Development Index. Um, and one thing that we actually see, in all countries, a vast majority of people think that priority should be given to, uh, to, to, to natives. Um, but actually, especially in these med medium income countries, uh, the, the, the attitudes towards, towards migration are actually most negative, uh, which we explain in that paper, is a paper with um, uh, Jenny Klugman, which we explain by this idea that like, well, in these very high HDI countries, sure, we hear a lot about like neg negative attitudes towards migrants, but at the end of the day, there's, there's social safety nets, you know? Like people don't have to worry about feeding their family as much. You know, there's certainly some of that worry. And then when we go here, the migrants of the, 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 the levels of migration are really small. So again, you know, there's, you know, th there's not so many negative attitudes about these yet. It's really in these middle income countries, middle, uh, medium HEI countries where we see a lot of this, uh, this competition going on. Um, I love your idea to look more into this. The one constraint that I have, I think, I don't think the World Value Survey has any geographical information other than the national level from what I remember. So I don't think, like, I love your idea to like sort of look geographically, is, is, am I, you think I'm wrong or? I, I don't remember which survey, oh. but oh. the survey we used, okay. there were cities. The oh, they do? The okay. Oh. oh, I would love to use that. Thank you so much. So, so the Gallup, and if you, if you have, maybe we can talk afterwards. I'd love to look into this. I, please. Please, d don't leave without, <laughs> I want to make sure, because that, that would be super interesting to kind of like uh, pin that down a little bit better. Let's go uh, back, by the way, and let me make sure. Uh, what else did we have? Um, da -da 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 -da. I, of course, didn't take. Um, oh, yeah, so, okay, I actually have one other thing that I want to show. It's a little bit about these questions about so the instrument, exclusion, restriction, et cetera. So if you could please go back, uh, and I'm going <laughs> to um, ask you uh, one other thing. I'm going to ask you to please, Put on a little button, sorry, the button of the testing the exclusion restriction, because I think that's going to come exactly to some of the worries that people had, uh, which I think are very valid, particularly on trade. Um, and here I have to put a disclaimer that the results I'm going to show you are actually based on my earlier paper with Jeremy Magruder. But the first stage is the same, so it should be the same result, but uh, we just haven't run it yet for this paper. Um, so what do we test? I actually think this is a fairly powerful test. Um, if there was something else, like trade patterns, that could uh, explain, uh, you know, that would lead to sort of similar variation, um, then we would expect that if we use any kind of different weighting scheme, rather than the half, quarter, quarter, but there's some other weighting scheme, maybe that would just produce similar results. So let's test it. Let's just bootstrap our weights a thousand, ten thousand times, and let's just see how often do we see results similar to the ones that we have appearing. And because if it were the case that our migrant rainfall measure is just picking up on something else, trade, whatever it is, then we would expect that a lot of these other uh, 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 waning schemes would just happen to also lead to very similar uh, predictive power. So we run that here first on the first stage. Um, our first estimate, our first stage estimate is right here, 
And as you see, it's even cut here in the, the horizontal axis. None of our bootstrapped uh, uh, weighting schemes comes even close to it. So what this is telling me is that there's something about specifically where these migrants were coming from. Not trade, not anything else. It's specifically where these migrants, or any, it could be anything, right? Any kind of correlated productivity gravity model of, of areas being particularly uh, close together. None of that is happening. Same with a reduced form. And then the last thing that I'll mention is we'll look at uh, uh, long distance migration as well. So rather than having just any move, we can say you need to move over at least 100, 200 kilometers. And if anything, we actually see that uh, migration over longer distances has, has stronger effects. Well, if there was any kind of trade or anything going on, there wouldn't be really a reason to believe that, 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 would be, that any kind of gravity model would predict that trade is greater if, if locations are smaller together. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can I just say yes, that please, I would have please. thought that if the problem is that migrants are going to places that because of the rainfall shock where they're living have now had a terms of trade improvement, i.e. are richer than before, mm -hmm. maybe that richness or that, that inequality in that area is aggravated where they're going to. Sure. And that's what's leading to more. That it's different than what's your okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's more like a mechanism of why, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's well, I, um, uh, I'm, I'm always a glass half full person. Uh, I don't think that's a concern. I think that would be just a way that, that we could explain our results. I don't know how I would use that to explain the pattern that we see results in the newspapers, but not on the household survey and on cry like that I couldn't explain that. But I, I do agree that like what whatever, and that's why I actually like the previous paper presented so much, it's sort of very carefully laying out every little step of the, the causal chain, so to say. All that we have is there's migrants coming in, there's effects on crime. That's, that's kind of where we're at. I, I, f I may have more questions, but I'm, I may be out of, okay, let me, okay, let me see what else I had. I have, Oh yeah, so actually, yeah, your, your question, um, Andrea, I have to admit, I've worked with IMFLAS for many years. I do not know of this. Of course, I know you have a lot of experience with the Amex FLS. Um, I will search for this module. I, I hope the module exists. There is, a cry, there is one cry module, IMFLAS 4, but it was actually so bad that they discontinued it. So the IMFLAS 4 cry module, it, it, we have at some point looked into, but it's just not a good module at all. But you seem to be talking about some kind of fear or something like that, right? So not that I, but the IMFLAS in general, I love that, and the MX FLS too, and I love the people who've worked in it. It's, these are such great surveys. They, they have people sit down on average two days to answer questions. Like these are, we know everything about these people. Um, Monotonicity, um, uh, again, kind of coming back to like what is the exact uh, uh, weather term. We try a couple of other things. Um, again, I'm not going to show uh, uh, more bonus slides, um, but um, the, the, for sure, a lot of rainfall can be bad. We actually don't see evidence of that in the Indonesian context, and that's mostly because it's a lot of rice growing. I, I have no doubt that it's true, right? I mean, there's floods, etc. but for any of the kind of variation that we're looking at, that was never a negative thing. And, and in fact, actually, David Levine and Dean Yang have a paper that actually does a very similar job as what they're doing in the beginning, where they look at the effect of rainfall on agriculture, like they combine it in a paper. I just cite Levine and Yang. <laughs> like that basically said, it's a monotonic linear relationship. Use that. I'm a little lazy. <laughs> All right, any other questions? I'm happy to, uh, to talk more after. Thank you so much for your feedback. So, uh, uh, Ana Maria, I was wondering whether, uh, if are there any other benefits such as tax collection, uh, net of uh, transfers to 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 the the migrants. So, I think it would be important to see the whole benefits to society at the destination rather than just the benefits for the migrants. Yeah. Sure, thank you very much for the presentation. I just maybe have a, just a question of clarity. I don't know, you might have mentioned it. Um, but I'm quite interested in, after the regularization of the migratory status, um, one, was that time bound? Um, and then secondly, I guess if it was time bound, uh, what then subsequently happened? Because I think in many places, you know, in the world, there's big question marks around specific amnesties or dispensations and what subsequently follows. The second one that I'm quite interested in is your earlier comment, and I'd love to just hear your reflections on this. Syria, Venezuela, 
and Ukraine. Um, now, if I look at all three of those places, I mean, you know, two of them conflict, right? Syria, Ukraine. Uh, but Venezuela, um, and I would probably add another country there, Zimbabwe, um, are direct outcomes of economic sanctions. Um, and effectively, if you think about Zimbabwe, a large part of the working age population is outside of Zimbabwe. So I'd be interested to hear just some of your own reflections, whether or not uh, the cause of the displacement is also important. So if the displacement is caused by conflict, um, should the policy response be different if it's caused, for instance, by, by say, economic sanctions? I, I have a quick question. I have a quick question, if I may. Um, I'm just curious if you get information on the Colombian side, uh, kind of if, if when migrants were more incorporated and they feel like more welcoming, do people actually, like more, excuse me, not more welcoming, but uh, rely more on the state? Do they also rely more on the Colombian counterparts in the municipalities? Like the Colombians receive them well? I, I pr probably it's beyond the scope of your work, but I don't know if you uh, get something of that. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, um, I was wondering, as you finished, and I was talking to another colleague here about that, the sense of, I mean, for integration, we, we need to both sides. And this is one side, and I think we could, we could find something interesting here. I was wondering if the qualitative data or in the surveys you asked about first the sense of belonging, belonging or, or sharing values with Colombians, if that changed, or if you have anything similar uh, in the questions. And second, how much exposure to the co to Colombians uh, was, uh, for example, when you are not regularized, you interact more with Venezuelans and with and stay in the neighborhood and stay there. And on the other side, when you feel that you are integrated, uh, whatever they perceive is integration, you will talk more to Colombians and you will feel empowered to talk and interact more with with them. Um, my question regards maybe maybe it's beyond the scope of the paper, but I would like to know, and that's a question that came up to me, is that maybe this program had some spillover effects over the access and the well-being of other Colombians, in the sense that I know that this program uh, was financed by the by the national government, so many institutions and municipalities and departments uh, gained new new resources for attending this, this population. So maybe that um, had some spillovers in access and quality to Colombians. Yeah, I, I was surprised to see the take up of that PAP is actually quite low. So I wonder if you could uh, at least tell us like what predicts that take up. I guess you can do that in your data just to kind of like look at who are the people who take up and who don't. Uh, and the other thing I'm just really curious about uh, being from here, why did the government do this? Like, I, you know, it, it, I just love to hear the motivation behind this because this is something that we don't usually see. <laughs> just a very basic question. Um, Maybe I didn't understand, but do you assume that all the people that arrived after the closure would all apply while we, we've seen that for the others the share was low, so I may have missed something. Yeah, just to finish, I wanted to, to build on that. And um, can you check like if, if the migrants that came after round closed, they are different? Because I don't know, if they hear that they are opening this registration, they might think this is like to help them somewhat and the, the people that might come could be different. Um, yeah. I'm going, I have some minutes, okay. Um, thank you very much for all the questions and for all, for all the suggestions. Uh, Renata, about tax collection, yes, this is very important. Uh, here, it's a very short-term effect, but I didn't show that. But you can see it somehow when you compare subsidized versus contrib contributive health system, because in the contributive one, you are paying taxes. Uh, and we have not looked at that, but we can do back-of-the-envelope calculations for that. And when they get formalized, they pay taxes. Uh, so that's important. So in the new version, when we are doing at the second wave, we are, we are going to start to look into all those issues. Something that we're finding, for example, for the second wave, which is very interesting, is that fertility rates dropped for people, for the woman. 
they decide to have less less kids. So that's important because then you have let's the, the state is going to have less kids to to take care of and to provide social services. But yes, we still have to do that, and that's something that is very important to do because migrants contribute in many ways, and one of those ways is starting paying taxes when they become formal, and that's that's important. Um, what happened after? That's a tricky question here because they, they could uh, request an extension after two years, but when this, those two years were going to end, the program did the new, the new one, the new PEP, which is called ETPB. So now they can stay for 10 years. So what we need to know is what's going to happen with this 10 year, this 10 -year program. Uh, what we are finding that is very important respect to what you are asking is that we ask whether they want to return, and when do they want to return? We ask that question in the survey, and we don't find that the program changes that. So willingness to return is very similar to the regular and the irregular migrants, and, and we really need to understand that a little bit more. About whether the effects are different, whether there are economic sanctions or conflict, I, I really, we don't have enough data to, to see whether the results can be different or not. My perception, I, I have worked, I worked for many, many years here in Colombia with forced migrants, internal migrants, and what is very important about all these processes of migration is that these processes are quite hasty. They are not necessarily completely voluntary because the conditions are so bad that they need to migrate and they do it in very poor conditions and in very difficult conditions. So regardless of what, what happened, what I think is more important is the migration process itself, no? that it was hasty, that you didn't have funds to fund the migration, and it, that the persons were in quite vulnerable conditions. But that's just a hypothesis of, of that. Mm, the Colombian side, <laughs> we have surveys for that, Colombians, uh, xenophobia in Colombia, Peru and Ecuador, who were the countries that received more migrants, increased significantly. And when we look at the surveys for that, the spike after some time increases a lot. Uh, but, and very, very interestingly so, when we ask them, that's a survey that we just did, whether they are willing to provide entrance to migrants, whether limited or not, people are willing to do that. And they are also willing to provide state services. So they don't trust migrants. They think that migrants are hurting the economy. But on the other hand, they are open to provide social services and to allow them to enter the country, which is, I, I don't understand very well why. <laughs> yes, it's kind of contradictory, but uh, we have to uh, understand it a little better. Sandra, your question is very important. We have questions of that in the survey. We I didn't show it here. But when we, were, when we were doing the focus groups, we had focus group for those that were PEP and those that were not. And the difference between the two groups was really stark because the, the PEP ones were much better. They had Colombian friends and the other ones were completely over the way. They were really, they cried in some focus groups. They were all crying. They were very pessimistic. So we do believe that there is a huge impact on integration. Uh, in the second wave, we include better questions because in the first wave, we include some questions and I think uh, the questions were not, we are not capturing that. But we do believe that that's a very interesting avenue for research. A spillovers effect, uh, I'm not sure that there are spillover effects. Uh, there is a study, a paper by, by a student of mine and he finds that uh, municipalities have to spend more for migrants not, and, and the tax effect has not kicked in yet. And social services sometimes they feel is, are overwhelmed. So that's kind of, you have both sides. Why is 64, I, <laughs> that's a huge mystery, Marika, because basically what happens is that the, the process to get into the registration is very easy. It was online. And for the ETPB, it was the same thing. And the take up, the take up even though people already knew what was happening and the, the benefits of this, it was at the beginning, it was quite low. So there are problems of people that left to Ecuador and to other countries, but also problems of people not being able to register there. Are, and we have information about that. I should have brought it and we asked those questions in the survey. Um, the motivation, the person who did that is at the IDB right now and we are going to organize a lunch with him so he can tell us that. So if you want to come, it's going to be a closed door lunch, <laughs> <laughs> but we can invite you. And I think that's it because we need to close. Thank you very much.